scripture passage for this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 through 15. Thanks, Rob. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a hilarious giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that, you, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So when we preach on Saturday night, whoever, whatever minister's doing the preaching, that would be the one who is there. But last Saturday, last night it was different. Um, and I overheard someone sitting about on the second row down the fellowship hall that said, look, all three of them are here. <laughs> and they said, it must be about money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, it's about stewardship, that's for sure. That's, that's the path we've been on. You heard Julie read the scripture. So some years ago, it wasn't here as another church. A lay person was giving a stewardship moment and they were quoting from this scripture in 2 Corinthians. And it sounded very familiar to me. It said, freely you have received, freely give. I nodded. And then they said something that sent a little ripple through the congregation. They said, and God loves a hilarious giver. Oh, I like that. But I thought maybe they have pushed on the original Greek just a little bit. This is, they've, they've stretched it. Well, I went back to my office and when I had a little time and got my theological Greek dictionary out and I found, whoa, they were moving toward the truth because the Greek word, moving it into English moves beyond really joyful, beyond cheerful to hilarious. Huh. Do, you, do you ever think hilarious and giving could come together? Oh, I think so. I mean, think where we were last week. We were looking at that uh, rather hilarious passage about God. You know, God, the extravagant, the excessive sower, gives not royally, no stint or measure, who um, throws out seeds of grace and truth everywhere with holy abandon, who um, feeds the birds and whistles at the thistles and the rocks and shouts hallelujah at the good soil and just keeps casting the seeds everywhere. Sure, yeah, hilarious giving. That's us. It could be. Of course, we've been talking about giving in the larger sense of the word. Now, today, we're getting ready to have an act of consecration where we're bringing giving to a focus, to giving to church, to a church. And maybe for some people, that's where the wheels of hilarity fall off. I know there's a lot of skepticism, cynicism about institutions, particularly the institutional church right now. I, I run into it sometimes. Um, I'm out in public and somebody will introduce me as a minister. And that gets a lot of different kind of comments, some favorable, some not so favorable. Sometimes people editorialize about what they think the state of the church is and how much hypocrisy, and that's why they don't go to church. And I just kind of shake my head. I'm not really into a long conversation sometimes, but sometimes I'd feel like saying, well, from your perspective, if you think church is a mess, how do you think it looks from the inside? Huh? 
I mean, I've given about 40 years to it. I have no illusions. I mean, I've been in these two, three hour long church meetings that everything in the meeting seemed as dead as four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. And I wish somebody would hold a seance so we could contact not the dead, but the living. You know, I've, I've, I've felt that way before. I, I, I have no illusions about the missteps, the mistakes of the church. But you know, I'm not really dismayed by that. Neither should any of us here. I love what Barbara Brown Taylor says about it. She said, um, yes, we are the people of God because of our blood kinship with Christ, but we're also the children of Adam and Eve with a hereditary craving for forbidden fruit salad. <laughs> Uh, he said, frisk any of us, any of us here today, and you'll see that we're carrying two passports. One says citizens of heaven, other one says citizens of earth. Okay, we have mixed parentage, not perfect. But we are the body of Christ, yeah, still. Church, it wasn't our idea. <laughs> It was God's idea of how to appeal to the world. From the get-go, Jesus chose to save the world, not by himself, but through commissioning people like us to be his body. And this is, this is what I have experienced through the years. You show me a fellowship of people like Central, a group of people who are committed to trying to follow Jesus into the world, who are turning their faces toward that light. And I'll show you a place where the lost are being found, where the broken are being forgiven, where the confused are finding purpose, where the strong are being challenged. It's not the kind of stuff that makes the headlines anymore. It's just your basic raising the dead kind of stuff. And it happens around here all the time. We're church, mixed parentage. We keep messing things up, but no matter how many things we mess up, some things will always go right. Why? Because finally we're not in charge. God is. Mistaken at times, confused, yes. Trying to fill shoes that are too big for us, but Jesus has been willing to work with this from the get-go. Igor Stravinsky, a composer, some of you recognize that name, and he wrote a new piece some years ago, and it had a rather lengthy and difficult violin passage, solo passage. And so he hands it to the violinist and says, go and work on it. The violinist takes it home, works on it for about two weeks, comes back to Stravinsky, throws down the sheet music and says, can't do it, can't play it, worked on it for two weeks. I think maybe it's unplayable. And Stravinsky says, well, wait a minute, you, you don't realize what I wanted, do you? Well, what do you mean? He said, I just wanted to hear the sounds of someone trying to play it. Church, sounds of people trying, trying to get it right. We'll never achieve all that God had in mind. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the sounds of Jesus' grace and truth will never be heard in this earth without us. And we get to be a part of that. that. That's why I think there should be a ring of joy, enthusiasm, maybe in even hilarity in the world, what we're getting to be a part of here today. Um, and we're going to be given to Central Church. I've been here 18 years. I know we're not perfect. No, we don't have it all figured out. But I, I've been here long enough. I know of some important things about this church. Th this is a group of believers really committed to making disciples, um, drawing people in, moving them from membership to discipleship, asking them to be a part of all kind of covenant groups, United Methodist Women's Circles, the NEST program, Disciple Bible Study, Sunday morning studies, Wednesday night, 20-something um, covenant um, journey groups. Mm -hmm. I, know this is, I know this is a church that's a welcoming church. It's a church of a really wide embrace. Anyone, everyone who comes through those doors, our message is, we're glad you're here. There's a place for you. 
I know this is a church of a, this a pilgrimage church. You don't find around here the hunker and the bunker, circle the wagons mentality. I find here this relentless stimulus to follow the Spirit of God that keeps saying, get up, go on, keep moving, keep pioneering new trails and new ways to be and do church. I know Central's a church with a missional heart. Day to day, there are acts of practical service overflowing into the community and the world from this, from this body of believers. I guess what I'm trying to say there ought to be joy. Every time the plate is, plate is passed here, every time we give of our time and talents to, to what we're doing here, because this is a group of believers that's trying, trying their best to play the melody of Jesus' glad gospel. At the heart of living into our identity as children of God is living into our ability to be a cheerful giver. It's a process. It's not something that I naturally lived into. I really believe that we are all children of God, but we are also in the process of becoming children of God. As much as we are all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, we're also in the process of becoming brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. One of my favorite theologians is a man named Henry Nouwen. And now one talks about four movements of the Holy Spirit that help us claim and live into our belovedness as God's children. These four movements are that we are all chosen, blessed, broken, and given. Now these words should sound familiar. They're words that we speak when we're here at this table, at Christ's table, when we come to partake in the bread. When we come to table, we take bread. It is blessed, it is broken, and it is given. As Christians, we are called to be the bread of heaven. We are called to be bread that is taken, it's chosen, that's blessed, broken, and given. Somehow, some way, every day, we are all being chosen, blessed, broken, and given. The fourth movement of living into who we're created to be is to be given. When we are first chosen, blessed, and broken, we are these things so that we can ultimately be given. Only when we are giving can we truly understand what it means to have first been chosen, blessed, and broken. There's so many different ways that we can give of ourselves. It can be in simple ways as sharing a smile, a handshake, a hug, or sharing a kind word. As children of God, our fulfillment is in becoming bread for the world. But at times, this can be so hard. So how are we to choose every day to live into this? In a society that is focused more on getting than on giving, the answer is simple, but it's really hard to live out. It's in giving ourselves. The people that help me the most are the ones that share their lives with me. I've not been at Central long, but I have been blessed through the outpouring of love and support of everyone here. It can be something as simple as one of our faithful members and a woman who's become a dear friend of mine by giving me a pair of pantyhose <laughs> that she happened to have in her bag when mine got a run in them a few moments before a funeral. Or this very same woman last week calling all of our central members at Givens and personally inviting them to a luncheon we're having there on Thursday. Every day I am here, I'm blessed by the outpouring of love of the people that I serve with. I don't know if you got to see where I sat today, but I got to sit in this little corner that's tucked right there in the middle of the choir and the brass ensemble. I got to be intimately part of the music that was created here this morning. I got to see Suzanne's face and Russell's face light up when they made beautiful music. I got to watch Corey's hands as they moved across the keys on the piano. I get to serve with Lynette, who is an amazing children's director. When I'm out in the community, I get as much feedback about how great Lynette's children's sermons are as how great Rob's sermons are. 
and we really do have one of the best youth directors here. <laughs> Our youth pastor, Eric, a few weeks ago when he was up here leading worship with us, while he was still fully robed and between the two services, hopped on a skateboard and skated down Church Street. He is legendary. <laughs> Serving here at Central has shown me that when we live together and share our lives, we can become a true community of love. Frederick Buechner said that the purpose of our lives is most evident in the place where our deepest longing meets the world's deepest need. While preparing for this sermon, Rob and Julie and I tweaked that a little bit, and we rephrased that to the greatest gift we have to give is most evident when our deepest joy meets Central's greatest need. Phrase that one more time, I'll repeat it. The greatest gift we have to share is most evident when our deepest joy meets Central's greatest need. Rob, one of your greatest joys and gifts is unpacking the scripture, opening it up to us every week, and then proclaiming that word. Your gift of preaching meets our need of being hungry for the word of God. Mm. And Julie, you have the gift of vision. You see the needs here at this congregation, and then you also have the vision to implement it. Every week you come and you have the vision of wearing really great shoes. <laughs> Somebody's got to bring it. You bring it. But you also bring the nest and visual arts and countless other ministries that you've seen a need for here at Central and had the vision to carry it out. I have the gift of healing. I am called to be a healing reminder of God's love and to journey with others towards wholeness. Rob has special lenses to unpack scripture and to see the word in ways that no one else can. And Julie has special lenses to see the vision of this church and to have the vision to implement it. And I have a special set of lenses to see the hurt and woundedness in people's lives and meet them where they are and journey towards wholeness and healing. There are not many congregations that can support someone like me full time on staff. And so it is a blessing to get to be here and to live out my call. Here at Central, I get to serve with people in Stephen Ministry. In Stephen Ministry, we meet the church's needs by journeying with people that need spiritual companionship and love. I serve with the prayer shawl ministry that wraps people up in prayer through the handmade sacred shawls. I get to serve with the bereavement committee that surrounds people with love at the time of loss and death of a loved one. And I get to work with the prayer ministry yeah. where we get to lift up the joys and concerns and things going on in each of our lives throughout the week through the powerful spirit of prayer. Central meets my greatest need of being here in a place where I'm able to give. Well, the question before us was, how do you see, where are you living out the joy of giving here in this place? Um, and so mine's very, very personal. Um, one of the things in, in all of my ministry, I, I love to teach and talk about money. Um, it's sort of a taboo subject, and, but what I have found in my own experience is that if I can trust God with my money, um, I can trust God with everything. Mm. I mean, that, that's just a hard place, isn't it? One of the things that I do with folks when I'm teaching is to say, um, I want you to take a moment and I want you to recall your earliest memory of giving or experience of giving. Just pull that up for me. Y'all got it? Your earliest memory. My earliest memory of giving was uh, as a little girl, uh, we went to this church named Central in Lenore City, Tennessee, and um, we would, my parent, my dad would drop us off at Sunday school. He owned a hardware store, he's third generation of this hardware store, and his hardware store was a block in front of the church. So he would drop us off and go to his office and work a little bit and then join us in the pew at 11 o'clock service. And so the minute he would sit down, my sister and I would fight over who got to get the tithe check out of his coat pocket. And we'd scramble over there and like dig it out, um, which is kind of funny because, the, you know, he always had it every week, but it would have been quite embarrassing if he didn't bring that tithe check. <laughs> we'd have ratted him out. Um, but also another thing that's been very, a memory that I have that's 
that's wonderful is being able to pass that plate as a child. That's why I really encourage when these plates are going out to allow the children to touch those plates and to help you pass them. Um, don't worry if that drop it, we'll pick it up. <laughs> because that's how they're learning to give. Sort of like pre-reading, they're learning to give that way. Well, um, that's my earliest memory of, of giving, and it's been a very powerful one. It's shaped me, and when I recall that memory, I can feel my dad's um, suit, pot, or suit, you know, and I can smell him and feel how it was to sit in that pew. Memories have, very, have a power in us, don't they, to shape us and shape how we behave in this world. And, but then we've grown up, right? And uh, it gets tough. When we have all sorts of things screaming for that dollar um, that we've made. And from, from the utilities that we have to pay the children to all these things, and it's, and it's hard. Um, the plate doesn't scream at us, right? So as we grow up and as I've grown up, I've, I've recognized that the, the times that I'm not giving as I feel called to give have been times when I felt the most distant from God. It's not about keeping the lights on. It's not about paying us, y'all. It's about your relationship with God. Because if we can trust God with our money, we can trust God with everything. Brian Boss tells a story, um, and his story is actually out in our gallery. I encourage you to, to go and just look at all the pictures and the stories in our gallery here. He tells a story of um, a really low time in his life when he started to come back into church. He'd been out of church for many years. He's a young man. He, he's a server in, at a restaurant in our, in just a few blocks away. And so his income fluctuates up and down every week. And his, he was in a really difficult time. And so his mom kept saying, Brian, get back to church. Get back in church and your life will get better. So he said, well, what can it hurt? It won't kill me. So he, he came and sat in the back and um, started worshiping. Of course, that plate was passed, and so he threw a couple of dollars in there, and he said, well, let's just see. Kind of approached it like an experiment. Let's just see what happens. So after throwing a couple of dollars in that first week, he, you know, st started to kind of be more aware of things, things that were given to him, and things started to open up. He started to feel a little freer. Next week, he gave a little more and a little more. He just approached it, like I said, like an experiment, and he found that joyfulness and giving, the hilarity of it. I think the hilarity comes in that, you know, it's scary to do that. He feared, you know, I won't be able to pay my bills and I won't be able to make ends meet. But he found that it, it actually, it, it didn't hurt that at all. In fact, it opened up himself so that he could experience generosity and thanksgiving in a way he hadn't before. And now, as he, he'll say, he says in his story, when he sits in one of the most joyful times during worship is when he pulls out that envelope and he thinks about all the people that he's served during the week hmm. and what they have given to him. And he's connected back to them through this act of giving. That's kind of what's happened with me. This act of giving has, um, it connects us, it begets itself. It's sort of contagious. Giving is contagious. It pours into other places of our lives, helps us to see and experience God in a way that we don't without giving of ourselves in that way. I have experienced great generosity through you all. I mean, personally, I'm not talking about my ministry, personally, you all have helped me raise my kids. I have an eight-year-old, or nine-year-old, and a five-year-old, and, I, and I, I lean on you a lot, and you're very, very helpful. Some of you have given many things to us, helped us when we've gone through difficult times, and even have given us a place to stay. And what that does for me, it causes me, that when I experience generosity at that sort of depth, I wonder, what in the world have I done to deserve this? When the answer is nothing. I really don't deserve it. And what that does for me is it connects me, has, makes me have this conversation with God. It's like, God, what? wow, I'm just floored by this generous person. And then God, God says to me, make that your life. 
And so my life now, my, my aim is to be that generous so that it connects people with God. That that sort of generosity becomes a hilarity and turns it on its head. Thank you, Amy and Julie. Thank you for letting us share with you in this way. What we really wanted to do here today is just recapture the, um, the joy, the romance of Christian stewardship. In the New Testament sense, Christian stewardship is that divine alchemy. It's magical, divine alchemy, by which money is transmuted into persons and material possessions, into riches of the mind and spirit. Jesus never saw money as a sinful thing. It's just part of yourself. It's stored up in your pocket, but it can be an almost almighty something. You can come and you can plunk it down on one of the counters of life, and you can say, I want to exchange this for that. Anybody been to any exchange counters this week? I have several different times. I've plunked my plastic down or my money down, said, give me that for this. At this counter, think about it. it, this really is a powerful thing. You and I get a chance to exchange materials we cannot keep for riches we cannot lose. We can put it to the use of truth for um, values and causes that ennoble and then enrich not just the human spirit, but the very work of the Spirit of God. And nobody can take that away. <laughs> Malls can't eat it, rust can't corrode it, thieves can't steal it. Sigmund Freud, uh, this is going to surprise you. You mean you're bringing the name Sigmund Freud into a stewardship sermon? Because, you know, he was something cynical about religion. He called himself um, a Jewish cynic. But it's really interesting to me, his favorite story, parable, was about this sailor, sailor shipwrecked at sea. He's lost at sea, but he's found by these um, folks from one of the South Sea Islands, and they rescue him on their canoes, and they take him back to their island. They carry him into town triumphantly on their shoulders, and they put him onto a crude throne. And he said, what's going on here? I'm sitting on, looks like the throne of this island. And then he finds out that um, every year, another person from the island got to be king for the year. And he thinks, this is great. I just got here and I'm king. And then he starts talking and kissing the stories. Well, what happens um, after your year of kingship is up? And he finds out that at that point you are banished from the island and sent to this barren island. But he's wily, he's wise, he's king for a year. And so he gets his carpenters to work to start building canoes so they can go to the other island. And, and he gets his gardeners to work so they will go and transplant fruit trees in that island. And um, farmers to plant crops there and masons to build homes. So at the year comes up, he's banished where? Not to a barren island, but to an island of abundance. So here we are. I mean, we're set loose in this world with one life to live, and we get to be king and queens over the stuff of our lives. It's our domain. We can live small, keep, hoard, stockpile, and bit by bit, we find ourselves on an island of deprivation, desolation, isolation. Or we can do what we do week after week and what we're going to do here today. We can come and we can bring our treasures to this counter. And we'll have a chance to find a habitation that Jesus called the kingdom, an experience that he called joyful, hilarious, my cup runneth over life. So that's our opportunity today. Some of you have had your pledge card for a week or more, and maybe already prepared. Some of you maybe have just received it this morning. Some of you may need more time, but this is our consecration Sunday. I imagine there's someone here that probably just frankly is not at a place in their lives 
that they can make a financial response. There are other responses always in Christian stewardship, time, talent, your prayers, your service, your witness. Uh, someone may say, I'm not quite ready to make my decision, but I'm going to make a commitment today that I will be making a decision. You can bring that card down. We're going to have the brass choir lead us in some moments of preparation if you need any more prayerful moments. And then as we sing the closing hymn, you're invited to come and bring your response. <laughs>